what's it all about. So it's about um, the unit standards, about ethical behaviour uh, in around customers' property, basically acting as a professional in a, in a uh, plumbing environment, um, being aware of your legal responsibilities in, re in relation to um, things like the Fair Trading Act, uh, Consumer Guarantees Act, the PGDB Act, um, the Privacy Act is another one, um, particularly important for big organisations because if they are found to be breaching the Privacy Act, you know, it can be quite a big deal and, um, you know, it doesn't look good in terms of their uh, reputation uh, as well. Um, also, in this topic, it touches on um, appropriate communication. Most of it's all common sense, uh, interacting with customers, dealing with various situations, and uh, being aware of your responsibilities as an employee uh, between you and your employer. I'm not sure if you've looked at the assessment first. I may or may not have it is the one that requires marking, and we are, have got a little bit of a backlog at the moment, so you may have been waiting a little while to get some marked. But working with our guys to get that up to speed. Um, so for you guys, you've got the interactive version of the study guide, the, the pre-training module. Um, you may have already worked through that and, and completed that. Uh, you may have even had a crack at the assessment. Uh, if you have, then you'll know what some of the specific questions are. So I'm happy to sort of discuss around those as well if you're having problems with any of them. Uh, so yeah, so. Generally, it's basically doing the right thing, doing what you would, uh, how you're treating people like you would like to be treated, uh, being reasonable and complying with the, the laws of the land. Um, that's sort of the big picture thing. Uh, you do have to be a bit careful when you're going in and out of people's property that you don't, um, that they don't perceive, even if you didn't do something uh, that was illegal or anything, that they don't get the perception that you're doing something dodgy. Uh, it is, you know, relatively intimate going inside someone's house and looking in their bathroom, perhaps an ensuite in their bedroom or something. So you don't want to give them the the wrong idea that you're, you know, there when they're not there or, or hunting through their undie drawer or anything like that. Um, you definitely want to avoid those sorts of uh, thoughts. So you've got to be careful about what you say and how you act and make sure it's appropriate and professional. Um, so it's pretty easy to be ethical and, and uh, have integrity. It's basically, um, you know, do do how you, you know, act in a way that is reasonable and fair and how you would like to be treated yourself. So, you know, if you're, uh, for example, on a lunch break or something where you, you take what's kind of pre-agreed that the lunch break will be, not you know three times as long as what it's supposed to be. Uh, likewise, in terms of work output and stuff like that, well, you do what's a reasonable day's work. You don't do half a day and go home. You know that's uh, obviously not going to go down well for too long. Uh, they work out you're uh, not doing what's expected. Uh, be accountable. So, you know, if things go wrong, some people make mistakes, we have accidents, we have floods, whatever, put a screw through something, scratch, drop it, whatever. If something goes wrong, you, uh, you know, tell the appropriate people, probably your boss first and, and then the customer uh, that, yep, that did go wrong and, and I did make a mistake and, uh, you know, we'll do the best we can to put it right, whatever that entails. That's why people have insurance um, to cover those accidents. Uh, covering it up is only going to make it 10 times worse when it comes to light and the guarantee that whatever it is will be noticed at some point. You noticed it when you did it, so someone else is bound to notice it at some point and uh, deny, 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 ultimately it would likely be pinned back on you because you were there and, and you were the culprit and no one else did it, so it's going to be pretty hard to uh, blame it on the dog or something. Uh, the Privacy Act. So this is this is an act of Parliament law. Um, it's pretty important. So there's a whole bunch of information around that about how businesses and individuals uh, deal with other people's information. So you're allowed to collect people's information. You've got to know who they are to send them an invoice and stuff like that. 
but it's illegal to go and pass that information on to a third party without their consent. So you can't go and sell your list of, you know, names and numbers to some, you know, advertising agency or something like that, just because you feel like it, and you're going to get a $500 voucher off them. That would actually be uh, in breach of the Privacy Act. Um, so you have to be careful about that. Likewise, if they've got their information lying around while you're there, you know, you can't go and take photographs of personal letters or bank account details, stuff like that. Actually, basically, you're one step away from robbing them at that point. Um, so you need to be careful about, you know, about what you're looking at and, and whether it's relevant to you or not. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the Privacy Act, you've got an obligation to protect their privacy and, and not pass that on to other people unless it's reasonable and, and or you've got the consent. So it's relevant to the, the work you did, like you're going to invoice them for the job and or for some reason they may give you your consent, their consent to pass on their details. So it might be that you recommend an electrician to do something for them. So you say, oh, I'll give them your number or whatever. So you, they give you permission to pass on their contact details. Is there some benefit to them? In some cases, somewhere big like Welltech uh, or other larger organisations may have a code of conduct that says what you can and can't do. Uh, so for example, we've got a results system that's got every student ever uh, that's ever been there. So I could go in and, and look someone's name up. Well, it would be a breach of our code of conduct if I went and looked up someone that had nothing to do with me and then, you know, rung them up and asked them out for dinner or something like that. That would be uh, quite inappropriate and a, and a breach of my employment conditions. So although it may not be, well, probably be a breach of the Privacy Act as well, certainly if I shared it with a third party. Uh, so if you do have a code of conduct, it would be good to know what that is. It would be part of your... Um, contract uh, so a lot of things are quite clean cut like this you know do you do something dodgy and and uh, incorrect you know if you know it's dodgy and incorrect we shouldn't be doing it you should take the possibly longer way of going getting the right part and doing it correctly or whatever it happens to be um you know if you're going to do it an illegal installation of something because it was quicker or you couldn't be bothered doing it the right way that again you know you're just opening yourself up to a whole heap of problems um worst case scenario probably as it comes before the plumbers board as as a complaint and then they prosecute you as a as a practitioner for doing substandard work so you know these things can sort of snowball if uh you open the door to them um, likewise, there's some other laws around it uh, in terms of the Gas Act in that if you do gas fitting work, you have to issue the gas certificate within uh, 20 working days. So you can't not issue the gas certificate, just haven't paid the invoice yet. That's actually illegal. It would be a convenient way of getting the money out of them, but it's actually in terms of law illegal. So you have to be careful that you, uh, as a, as a, employer or and even as employee are, are following the right rules even if it doesn't that convenient to you personally oops um so yeah so basically broadly ethical behavior is is behaving in a, an appropriate way for whatever situation you're in um, and being fair and reasonable to other parties Likewise, you would hope that they are fair and reasonable to you. Um, and if they're not, you probably won't deal with them again in the future. You'll say, oh, well, that's not worth the hassle. I'll, uh, I won't go back to that guy's house and do any more work because he's pain in the ass. Uh, so here's an example of an ethical situation. So it should, could be that you go and, um, you know, you go there to, they've got a leaking toilet or something, it's dripping, 
and to go there and, uh, you know, you yeah, worked out that all you had to do was, you know, adjust the the inlet valve or something because it was set to incorrectly and it was overflowing. So you, adjust, you adjust that and it fixes it. But instead of telling them that, you say, oh, the toilet stuff, mate, you need a whole brand new one and then sell them a brand new toilet for 10 times the price. So that, that would be unethical uh, conduct. They may never know, but, um, you know, it would, it would be unethical business operation to do something like that. So you go there, they wanted you to fix it, you fixed it, job done, off you go. Uh, what does happen um, in the industry, and it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's unethical, it's, it, but it's done sort of to protect the business from callbacks, and that is like you go to a job, something like that, and instead of just adjusting it, you replace the whole inlet valve, even though it didn't really need it, potentially. Um, and that's because you might adjust the other one, and then you know two weeks later it starts overfilling again because it was only you know temporary fix on the day seemed okay, but maybe the washer needs replacing, whatever. It's stretched. So that is a practice that's sort of crept in with the new, the throwaway society. So rather than repairing valves or things like that, like a pressure reducing valve, you could buy a repair kit with a washer or and even the big diaphragm washer. It's much more common. Basically, almost every place would just replace the valve, even though it's maybe $300 compared to $50 worth of parts. What it does is it eliminates the need for a callback. So if possibly the, the brass was worn or something and you'd replace the washer and it seemed okay, and then a week later or a day later, it starts playing up again, you've eliminated the callback at your cost. So it's... um. That's probably what I call ethically borderline in terms of practice. So I understand why businesses do it, but at the same time for the customer, potentially there was a, a cheaper solution that would have done the job just as well. Uh, but by putting a new one, you're, you're giving a level of guarantee that it will be right and it will be right for a, a longer period of time. And the product has usually then got a level of manufacturer warranty to back it up as well if something did happen to it. Um, I don't know if it's particularly ethical, but it's always important to, uh, yeah, speak to customers in a professional way. So, you know, you can swear as much as you like to your mate in the van on the way there, tell them about your wild weekend. But when you get there, you need to, um, you know, communicate in a professional way. So, you know, I mean, some people, if they're swearing at you in a, in a friendly manner, then uh, they probably won't care if you throw in the odd swear word. But if you're talking to someone else, they might find that super offensive. Um, so you just need to be a bit careful and um, look at who you're, um, who you're communicating with and what their expectation is. If you're, you know, uh, more conservative with how you approach things, you'll never upset anyone. So that's probably the best way to deal with it. Uh, here's another one. It's probably... Uh, want to be careful about criticising other people's work. You go there, you see some semi shonky work and go, oh, geez, that was crap. What you might find is that they used the same company that you worked for last time and they did it as well. So you've kind of shot yourselves in the foot uh, on that one um, and now they expect you to fix it for nothing. So, um, you know, if there's something dangerously wrong with it, certainly it might need repairing or you might point out that while you're in there, you put some extra clips on or something. But you don't want to go and slam anyone else um, too hard uh, because it may may backfire if you're unlucky. Uh, here's a few other just general things. Obviously, being honest and trustworthy. Um, you know, the board have this. Um, fit and proper person policy. And I see in their latest newsletter, they're looking at making it an annual requirement rather than just when you first license. It still seems a bit stupid that they don't do it for limited certificate holders and or exemption holders because uh, they're potentially more likely to have a criminal history, I guess. Uh, and they don't, don't seem to come into account, but it may be the legislation and how it's written that they can't take action against those people. Uh, here's 
you know, the things that we're too worried about that. Uh, so, yeah, so when you apply for your initial registration, so for you guys, that would be your tradesman license. Uh, so as a tradesman plumber or drain layer or gas fitter, uh, you have to fill, meet all the requirements, which is gain your New Zealand certificate. Uh, part of that's also passing the, uh, the licensing exam. Uh, then you do an application that includes a police clearance, uh, the money and filling in all the form. Then it goes to the actual board members to sort of rubber stamp it. Um, but if you do have um, you know, a number of criminal convictions or something like that, the board may require some further information from you. Um, and that's linked to this fit and proper person policy. Uh, so they don't want to register people that don't meet the bar in terms of um, what they might have got up to in the past. So um, the threshold is very high. So, you know, you can have convictions for drink driving, beating people up, whatever, and still meet the board's requirements. Uh, probably the ones that they're concerned about is um, uh, theft, financial fraud, um, possibly rape, um, murder, I guess, would be, you know, pretty extreme. Uh, so pretty high threshold type things um, that that would likely have, you know, involved time in prison. Um, uh, so even if you had those types of convictions, you'd, um, you know, sold 20 pounds of marijuana to someone and, and got busted, um, Provided you provided them the detailed summary of the court, they can then make an informed decision and they may register you anyway. So just because you have a conviction doesn't mean that it's a, a deal breaker, it just means that they're going to ask for more information. Uh, so the rationale behind that is that the industry plays a essential part in safeguarding the health and safety of the public and uh, the PGDB Act requires them to satisfy that the person is fit and proper before they can register them. It is a bit funny that in your current situation, you're on a limited certificate, you don't have to meet those requirements, yet you're in their people's houses doing all the same work as you would if you were registered. So to my mind, that makes the legislation a bit silly, but uh, it is how it is currently. Uh, so if you didn't provide them with additional information that they requested, it's likely that they wouldn't uh, approve your registration. Uh, the other thing that I'd consider is when these um, convictions happen. So if you did you know, a, a spree of burglaries when you were 16 and then now you're 30 and you've suddenly got your life together and decided to become a plumber, you know, that would be, oh, that was 15 years ago or more. Um, you know, that's something that you've had 15 good years of, of not being a menace to society. They're likely to uh, consider that a positive when considering it. Um, so there's a few other pieces of legislation that are sort of covered within this assessment or touched on um, and need to be aware of. Uh, so we've got the uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry, no, I bump bump the power plug and it stopped for a second. Um. Yeah, so the Fair Trading Act, so that's basically uh, about advertising and misleading information, misleading consumers. So under the Fair Trading Act, any advertising, sales, you know, pretend advertising where you're kind of making it look like something else that isn't advertising, uh, but it is, uh, it kind of sets the rules out around that. So if you make false claims like, um, you know, <laughs> Um, I don't know, 
pay for one tap washer and get 10 free or something and then you go there and you're charging for five anyway or whatever it was it was only the second one was free uh that's the sort of thing that would come under the fair trading act so whatever you promote or advertise that you're going to do you've got to kind of front up and, and do it uh, basically uh consumer guarantees act so that is uh uh, overarching um, minimum guarantees, regardless of whatever guarantee the the product manufacturer or anyone else uh, decides is is what the product's worth. So what that basically says is that the product should be at least comparable to similar products on the market. So if you buy a brand new TV and it lasts, you know, one year and craps out. And only had a six month warranty. Well, if a TV is expected to last at least five years, you may still be entitled to a new one, a replacement one under the Consumer Guarantees Act. So they can't, you know, get out of that effectively. It's a little bit not black and white because it doesn't, you know, cover every specific scenario. But basically, it would be what is the expectation? If you buy a new car, would you expect it to last? you know, five years or do you expect it to go, you know, 10 years time? Well, you'd kind of expect it to be working in 10 years time provided you maintained it, you know. So if it craps out in five years, you would expect the, the person that sold it to you to front up and repair it at their cost, not yours. Um, uh, then the Privacy Act, we already talked about this a bit. Uh, so that's basically about uh, retaining um people's private information and um you know not share so what's not relevant to you um the building act so that's about licensing of building practitioners and uh within um the new zealand building code basically the how-to guide of how to build a building and construct it um so that it um, meets New Zealand requirements. Uh, so there's quite a bit under that falls under the building. Um, Health and Safety at Work Act. So all businesses taking place, no matter what they do, must comply with the Health and Safety Work Act. Uh, basically, that puts the onus on um, the business, the PCBU, and their representatives, such as the director, or owner to uh, make sure that all their employees are adequately trained, are notified of the hazards that they're going to have to deal with, and provided with PPE, and they can do it in a safe and appropriate way. Um, the onus on you as an employer is to make sure you work in a safe way, don't endanger anyone else, and utilise the safety equipment provided to you. And if you don't know how to do something that you actually raise that issue with the employer or a supervisor so they can actually show you how to do it safely and correctly. Uh, it's also the Health Act. So because plumbing has um, you know health connotations in terms of if the water supply is contaminated uh, or if sewerage is allowed to, you know, go not to an appropriate outfall, so it was leaking out under the house or something like that into the groundwater. Um, uh, so, you know, we've kind of linked in with that. Uh, it's more about the water supplies and there is a specific new water supply act as well. Quiz time, so I don't have any quizzes here. So I didn't, uh, to do that. Sorry, Martin. Um, uh, are we meant to be looking at um, the, the PowerPoint or the? Uh, hopefully you can see the PowerPoint if I stop doing that. No, it's just stopped. It stopped about a couple of minutes ago. Oh, okay. I did just check my. Um, I'll try doing it again, starting it off again. Oh, good. I was just wondering. Yeah. Sometimes it could be a connection issue. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, I did. Um, I did pump the bump my multi box, which um stopped my mouse and speaker and all that for a second. So that may have affected it. Yes. So sorry. Yeah, it should have been kind of following along with with the thing. 
Um, what about any questions from you guys just on what we've covered there briefly or any other general questions on the topic? Not so more good. Okay. It's not the most exciting one to do, but it's, it's okay. I think we just got a little bit more detail on each sort of uh, th main thing there. So we'll go through that um, and then we might see where we're at, maybe look at a couple of uh, practice type questions. Uh, so the Fair Trading Act is about ensuring a fair deal for consumers and, and for businesses. Um, and the main thing it's really is about is protect, stopping businesses engaging in misleading or deceptive conduct. So kind of tricking you into buying something that, that wasn't quite what you thought it was or was substandard quality or paying too much for something that you, you didn't really they didn't really deliver on what you thought they were going to deliver. So those things are actually illegal under the Fair Trading Act. Um, so it's things like, you know, when they say, oh, 50% off sale or, or whatever, you know, they legally, although they probably do, but legally they can't mark it up the week before the sale and then say it's 50% off when it's actually only 10% off and, you know, it's close to its normal retail price anyway. So that's actually illegal under the Fair Trading Act. Doesn't mean that people don't break the law. People break the law all the time, like speeding down the road, but uh, it means that if they were prosecuted and the commerce commission sometimes takes prosecutions against quite big companies like vodafone or whoever uh for breaches of this uh fair trading act often relating to misleading advertising uh prohibits certain unfair trading practices um provides for consumer information and product safety standards regulations and unsafe goods notices uh, so covers a, a few different things So examples for, you know, plumbing could be that, you know, it'll it'll last a lifetime or something and probably won't last a lifetime. It might last 10 years or, or whatever. Um, you know, saying that it's zero maintenance when it actually needs maintenance. Um, you know, advertising uh, a super cheap install and then tacking on a whole heap of extras to bring it up to what the normal going rate is anyway so infinity installed for two thousand dollars and then you know you go and get the job and then there's a thousand bucks worth of extra stuff that wasn't part of the deal you know so it may end up being just as dear as anyone else if not more so those sorts of things would be misleading So it could be advertising as a certified plumber when you're not. That would be in breach of two acts because it would be in breach of the Fair Trading Act because you'd be misleading advertising, saying you're, you are something you're not. But it also be a breach of the PGDB Act because only registered people can do uh, or licensed people can do restricted plumbing work. And if they weren't um, registered and licensed, then they would be doing that illegally, uh, which means they shouldn't be doing it. Um, but there's a few other few examples so saying it's something it's not like saying it's a, a solid brass tap where it's only brass coated plastic or something um, saying it's made in New Zealand where it's made in China those sorts of things oh, offering prizes and then never uh, delivering on them um, uh, bait advertise where you advertise something but suddenly on the day that you advertise that you ran out and then you sell them something else instead that's twice the price unfair contracts so you sell them something and then within the contract it says you've got to get them back every five minutes at exorbitant rates to maintain it or something Uh, Consumer Guarantees Act, so like I said, this is basically a, a 
generic sort of guarantee uh, that things will meet the minimum quality. It applies to goods and services as well. So obviously plumbing is a service industry. We provide services to customers. We don't actually make the toilets. Uh, but because we've installed it, you know, the first port of call from the customer is that it would come back to us. So if there's something wrong with the product that we installed and we supplied it, uh, it's on us to get it rectified. Now, we may then go back to our supplier, Plumbing World, for example. We might go back to Coroma, who then might honour the warranty. Um, and, you know, there's obviously some labour and hassle involved in all that. Uh, that's one reason why most plumbing places will only install uh, products that they supply themselves rather than something they got from Trade Depot or whatever. Because potentially, if that toilet is, you know, not of the normal, not as, as good a quality, it may be okay. It may have issues. If there's issues, kind of then falls back on you as the installer to resolve them, even though it wasn't really your problem. Um, that's where it can get a little bit difficult. Uh, so, if you're providing goods, they must be durable, fit for purpose, free from defects, acceptable standard. Uh, match the description of the model, show on, so you can have a picture of one thing and turn up with something else. Um, they must have spare parts available. Uh, so, that could be an issue with stuff bought like on Trade Me or whatever there you know, an, an auction, uh, which they may not have the same backup service, even if they're operating as, as a sort of mini business. Um, often what they have, if it's cheap junky stuff, is they'll just replace it. So they won't actually have spears. They'll just have, here, oh, here's another crappy one, stick that in, that's your replacement. Um, which is okay if the other one works, but if that plays up, um, you know, going back and forward, replacing shonky equipment can, can add up to a lot of wasted time that's difficult to charge out to the customer because you're trying to keep your customer happy as well. So some of it is better to be harder up front and say, oh, I'm not still in that it's junk than end up with all the hassle downstream. In terms of the services, must be carried out with reasonable kill at skill and care. So... You know, if you do your job properly every day, even if you're a little bit slow at the stage because you don't have a massive amount of experience, you're still building that up. Speed will come with experience as you get more efficient in your work practice. You know what to do. You don't have to think about it. Um, you can preempt any problems. You know, you know that drilling through that bit of wood like that's a pain in the ass. You've now bought an angle drill, whatever it is. You've got better drill bits. Um, you know, the speed will come. But as long as you continue to do a good quality job, no one can ever fire you. Um, you know, customers can't really complain. They might moan that you're expensive, but at least you do a good job. Most people would rather have uh, an expensive plumber that does it right and does it once than a cheap one that causes a whole bunch of floods and all sorts of problems. You know, they won't, they'll get the expensive guy back because they have confidence that you're doing it correctly. So you don't you want to undersell yourself on the quality of your workmanship. Always take that extra time to make sure it's done right. Uh, if you provide something that's not fit for purpose, so you um, install and stick in a heater or something or a wood burner or whatever it happens to be, and you say, oh, it's going to heat your whole house, it'd be fantastic. And in the middle of winter, the house is still freezing and only heats that one room. So you've kind of oversold it. Uh, potentially, you may then kind of be in the gun to upgrading it or, or replacing it with something that does work as a, as a business owner. Uh, doing it within a reasonable time frame. So even if you haven't agreed on one, so, you know, if, if you're doing a, a bathroom renovation and you say, oh, you know, take three weeks or whatever it is, is sort of the rough ballpark. And then three months later, you're still going. That would be unreasonable. There may be things outside your control, like you couldn't buy any jib or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, that's where continued communication is important. And also thinking about this situation, if they've only got one bathroom, they want it going as quickly as possible. 
Uh, and if there's something delaying it, you need to kind of come up with some sort of compromise to get at least part of it going so they can utilize it. Uh, being reasonable in terms of price, if you haven't agreed for price, so if you're doing something, charge up or whatever. Uh, you know, if you charge them $10,000 out of the blue, that's going to be quite a shock to most people. Um, uh, and if that's way out of line with uh, what someone else would charge, that may well be a, a breach of the Consumer Guarantees Act. So the Consumer Guarantees Act does not apply in uh, some other situations. So if you're buying it privately, so if that's like if people buy something off a private seller on TradeMe, there's no guarantees. If I sell you a, a set of secondhand car wheels with a cracked rim and I didn't tell you that, well, you know, too bad, suck it up. If you work it out, you can give me some shitty feedback, but that's about it. You can't really do anything else about it. Uh, if you're selling things commercially, so from a business to a business, there's actually no protection either. It comes under a different legislation. Um, so that's be something to watch out for. Uh, but typically there would be a level of uh, supplier backup for whatever they're selling it if you go through a reputable supplier. If someone just changes their mind, well, that's they've changed their mind, not you. You didn't you put in what you said you were going to put in. So that's on them. So if they want to suddenly change from a, a pink toilet to a white one, well, that's fine, but they'll probably have to pay for the pink one and the white one. Um, so, you know, if they're indecisive, that's their look at. Uh, if they go ahead and damage something after you've done it, um, it's where it can be useful to um, take photos of, of the work you're doing once it's finished, to prove that it was there and it was done properly. Be a little bit careful with that, and it's one of the questions they have is, if you're taking photos, it's okay to take photos of your work, but it's polite to ask them for their permission first. Certainly don't want to be taking photos of things that have got nothing to do with your work, uh, because you know it's likely to be a breach of their privacy and or upset them. Uh, if something goes wrong, I think first port of call is you should go back to whoever provided the service or the product and ask them to fix it and repair it. Um, so basically it's up to you to sort it out. So if, say the example, the hot water heater stops heating water that you installed. Um, so you can't just flog it off to the manufacturer. You installed it, even though you didn't make it, it's still on you to sort it out. So. You would go there, you might find that the element's burnt out and it's, um, you know, 14 months old. Uh, you might check the warranty document and it's got a two year warranty. So you can then go back to Plumbing World or whoever it is, uh, get a re equivalent replacement element, go and change it, or have an electrician change it, depending on whether you've got the, the right license to do that. Uh, and then they'll likely credit you the cost of the, of the element. Um, terms of labour, well, unfortunately, that's all on you. So uh, basically, you've just gone and done the job for nothing. That's, that's where you've got to make your profit in the first place. In some cases, you may be able to claim your labour cost back from the manufacturer, but that's likely to be a pain in the ass. Uh, it's probably easier just to suck it up and uh, keep the customer happy because then there'll be a future customer and can make more money off them later on. Uh, likewise, it needs to be reasonable. So, you know, if you flog them off for two months and they've got two months of cold water, that wouldn't be very reasonable. In that case, they're more than entitled to go and get someone else to fix it and then send you their invoice and get you to pay for the cost of repair, which is going to be a lot dearer than you fixing it yourself. Uh, if it can't be fixed, uh, they may be entitled to a replacement of similar value or a full refund. Uh, and they may even, like I said, potentially get someone else to finish it off if you kind of refuse to do it or, or are unable to do it due to other work commitments, and then they can send you the bill. 
uh, which is you know getting a bit messy. Obviously, it goes to dispute. They may go to small claims court. That's more time and money sort of wasted turning up there. And um, it's easier to keep people happy up front. Uh, so there's some examples there. Um, you install a central heating system and it breaks down because you didn't install it correctly, potentially. Not sure how they know that. Uh, the customer can then make you put it right so they can call you up and tell you to fix it. Uh, potentially they could also hire a replacement machine, heater of some description to uh, get them going until you turn up and sort it out and, and claim that cost from you. So basically any compensation that they, they are entitled to can be no more than equivalent to if it had all worked out happily in the first place. So basically whatever you were supplying or providing, if that's not going, that they're entitled to have the equivalent of that going or the costs to keep it going um, until it is resolved properly. Uh, another important thing is it's important to advise the customer of any ongoing maintenance requirements or servicing type stuff that needs to happen. Uh, so sometimes with some systems to get like an extended warranty or meet the general warranty requirements, it needs like an annual service or something. So uh, you need to tell them up front about that and include that when you're selling them the product uh, kind of before you install it. Um, Otherwise, it kind of gets in a gray area and there's a question about this in the assessment where if you didn't tell them and it did require servicing and the warranty was conditional on that, you're, you've actually got a level of liability to service it at no charge. Now, that's not going to be for the next 30 years, but, you know, probably maybe maybe until the warranty period would expire at the very least once or twice or part of the cost towards that. So it's important to... Provide them all the information up front. Uh, there's a point of note. So if something, uh, for example, you installed this new cylinder, had a two-year warranty, um, and the element crapped out, that's fine, and they re you replace the element under warranty. Uh, the warranty is still only from the original date, not from the date of you, when you put the new element in. So they don't get another two years on the element just because you've replaced it. They'll still only have the remainder, the six months or whatever's left on the original warranty. Potentially, they could have some rights under the Consumer Guarantees Act in relation to the replacement, particularly if it's a full and complete replacement. So if, you know, it was an instantaneous unit and that was beyond repair for some reason, crapped out, uh, and it was replaced, even though the manufacturer warranty might have expired, it should still operate for a reasonable length of time under the Consumer Guarantees Act. So. Where it's those sort of grey areas, it's not quite as clean cuts where it can get a little bit difficult to know what is the, the correct law and may may potentially, you know, go to an arbitration or small claims court to resolve that if you disagree about what the requirement is. Um, a lot of goods aren't manufactured in New Zealand, so typically uh, any issue with the product would go to the importer, um, usually we're the go-between. So if we install it, suddenly we are the contact point. So any complaint will go to us, and then it's up to us to then go to the, the importer or the manufacturer to resolve it on behalf of the customer, which is you know, a bit of a hassle if you have a product that is problematic.
Privacy Act. I don't think we really need to cover too much more there. I think it's fairly straightforward, basically. Don't share information that's not appropriate. Uh, keep it to yourself and keep it stored in a safe way so that it can't leak out. Obviously, there's like these, um, you know, international hacks of computer systems. Uh, Waikato Hospital or something lost all their data. It was a privacy breach. So it can actually be difficult in a big situation to maintain cyber security and prevent the leaking of that information unwantedly. Um, so by the, the fact that they were hacked and lost that information, potentially held to ransom over it, they, they were actually in breach of the Privacy Act, although unintentionally, it's just their IT system security wasn't as robust as it needed to be, and it's likely they hacked in through someone who worked there uh, by working out what their password was, probably from a, a spam type email that got through the net. So yeah, make sure you don't pass on any of the unique details to anyone else, you're fine. Uh, workplace codes of practice or, or maybe even an informal policy uh, so it may only be verbally done. Usually it would be, you know, linked to your employment agreement, maybe provided with that. And these are the breaks, da, da, da. These are the work hours. Usually that's all spelled out and written in the writing. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of different employers out there. Uh, so there's a few generic questions about that in the assessment. Basically put down what you think would be reasonable. Whether your company is strict on it or not, they might not care what you look like you know, what you wear, how your hair looks, stuff like that. But just for simplicity's sake, put, you know, neat and tidy dress, you know, take your breaks when you need, to, when you're allowed to, you know, only use your phone for work calls, stuff like that. You, you'll get it, the questions right. Customer service. So customer service is pretty easy, really. It's a bit like ethics. Basically, you know, you just think about how you would like someone to come and work in your house and, and what you want to do. Basically, don't make a big mess. Obviously, you're going to make some level of mess where you're working. Uh, confine it to that area. It's good practice to kind of do at least the basic sweep up every night, even if you're going to go back for the next week and continue working there. Uh, if it looks reasonable and organised, their impression when they come home from work of, of your professionalism and ha what's happening and how it's going will be a lot better. Obviously, when you're in the middle of it, you might have things all over the place, might have all your tools laid out on the floor, but, you know, that's fine. But when you pack up, you pack up your stuff, you take it away with you and, um, you know, leave it reasonably neat and tidy. Uh, another thing is, you know, using drop sheets and stuff like that, keeping your tools off finished surfaces off carpets you know put something down to protect surfaces and just be generally careful about you know what you do with stuff uh it's also important to liaise with other trades so you know what they're doing and you know you know they know what you're doing and you don't trip over each other just makes life a lot easier you know you don't end up having to do things twice because they're putting a powerpoint there or whatever whatever it happens to be uh personal presentation you know, there's different expectations. If you're on a commercial site, they're probably not as fast, although you may have to have high vis and shitloads of PPE. Um, but, you know, working in someone's house, you know, it's ideally probably your company would have a uniform and, and you would keep that neat and tidy and not covered in silicon and stuff like that. But obviously, if you're digging drains and doing drain laying, it's probably not so much a big deal because you're going to get all dirty potentially anyway, or if you're crawling around the house or stuff like that, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, get some decent boots. Your boots are part of your PPE, so your employer should pay for them anyway, not you personally. Yeah, make sure you brush your teeth and use deodorant. That's obviously very important. Communication. Um, yeah, people like to be informed, they like to know what's happening. Um, some people could be a little bit funny to deal with, but you know, if you're upfront and clear about what's happening, uh, 
you know, you usually minimise any complaints or upset. Um, so, you know, lay it all out in front, be honest with them, give them the scenarios, you know, don't just sell them the best case scenario, tell them, okay, this is what I think is going to happen, this is what could happen, this might be what I find, there's, there's actually more than one potential result here. Um, you know, where you're going, why you're going back to the merchant to get something, when you're coming back, if you're not able to come back, suddenly go do something else, ring them up, let them know. You know, what time you expect to arrive, make sure you're within sort of, you know, at least half an hour of that. You know, maybe give them a ring if you're running late, just so they know that you're still coming. Because, you know, if they've taken the day off or they're coming in late to work, to be there to let you in or something, you know, they want to be well informed. Um, if something's going wrong, you know, things go wrong, things break, you're trying to take a tap off or whatever, suddenly it shits itself. You're doing any maintenance work on secondhand stuff, anything can break at any point. So, you know, let them know beforehand. I'm, I think I can fix this. I'm going to do this. But, worst case scenario, the brass breaks, it's old, it's brittle. You know, you may need to replace it. At least they know up front that's a possibility. Uh, so, keep it clear. If things are getting like out of hand or whatever, don't have a big argument with them. Say, so, okay, look, I'll, I'll ring up my boss. You can talk to them, palm it off to them. That's why they make the big bucks. They can deal with the big problems. Um, that way you're sort of protecting yourself. They're getting it from the, the boss. They may The boss may be prepared to, to do the job for nothing to keep them happy. Who knows? You can't make that decision. So, you know, if it's getting difficult, um, call out for a bit of extra um, managerial support. Likewise, if you're there, and you're looking at something, you think, flip, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never seen one of these before, but no idea. You know, maybe make a um, a phone call to the boss in the van or something. You don't really want to, you know, make out like you're incompetent in front of the customer. So, you know, think about how you're doing it. You want to, you don't want to give a, the wrong impression, even if you do have no idea what you're doing. Uh, but you don't want to go ahead and, and do something and wreck it or be actually dangerous or unsafe. Um, because you, you're lacking knowledge of what to do. So if you don't know, you know, call up our 800 helpline and, and get some support. Other, yeah, just general crap. Look them in the eye, be polite, friendly, you know, say hello. Um, it's much easier dealing with a situation that goes wrong with someone you've already got a good rapport with than someone that doesn't like you. If they don't like you, you're just there, they think they're ripping you off or whatever, it's gonna be a big shit fight. But if you've already got a good relationship with someone and something goes you know, slightly pear-shaped, usually they'll be fine. They won't get stressed about it. You say, oh, oh stuff happens, you know, okay, well, let's, we'll just need a new one anyway. Fine, go ahead, get the new one. So it just makes life a lot easier. Um, yeah, same sort of crap. Sometimes you can do the McDonald's on them and, and do a bit of an upsell. So while you're there, you might see something else that looks a bit dodgy. So you could uh, offer to repair it if you had time while you're there or, or to book in to do it later on, something like that. So most people like that. Give them the choice. Don't just do it and then send them the bill. So if you were there to do something else, that's what you're there for. That's what they're paying you for. They're not paying you to do something additional. But while you're there, if you can reseat the tap in the kitchen while you're at it because it's dripping, that might be added value to them, minimal extra cost. You get something extra out of it as a business. Um, and you've just made another friend, you know. They think you're wonderful then. I think there's a bit of a question on this. Uh, about the service chain. May not be exactly the same. Um, but basically, if the customer rings you up, they're requesting the job, they're likely to contact uh, your reception staff. Depends on the scale of your business. If the one-man band, he may take all the phone calls as well or just go to an answer message and get them call people back in the evening. Uh, bigger businesses uh, will have a reception. So they'll 
jot down the details of the job, who, what, where, when, uh, and then allocate it at some point to the frontline staff, you, the guy in the van running around doing things. Uh, depending on what it is, uh, you may need to go to the suppliers and, and get some bits and bobs to fix whatever they need, new tap outside or something. Uh, the suppliers are getting all that stuff from the uh, manufacturer or the importer, depending on who it is. So manufacturers, distributors are kind of inter interconnected. Um, and then after you do all the job, uh, basically your admin staff are going to uh, flick out the invoice and hopefully get it paid as soon as possible. In some cases with uh, Fergus or Simpro, you may even invoice them on the day when you do the job. Uh, so you may actually be part of that at the end as well. Uh, so, yeah, to build a big, successful business, I mean, customer service is pretty critical, being responsive. Uh, the other thing it can do is, is kind of book in ongoing maintenance, gas maintenance, whatever, kind of have reminders that go out to people and, and kind of prompt them to generate more work for you, particularly commercial type people. You know, they, they kind of are more likely to desire ongoing maintenance, but equally some domestic customers will... Uh, Want that as well. Uh, if customer complains, that's because they're unhappy or misinformed about something. Um, so if you're there on site and they're moaning to you, uh, do your best to rectify it. You don't want to go outside the scope of what you're there to do. If they're moaning about something that's got nothing to do with you or something that happened six months ago, probably not directly your problem. Uh, so in that case, you may need to escalate it to your employer or or manager, uh, up to them to then how they go ahead and deal with it. What you don't want to do is escalate the situation. So you want to uh, tone it down effectively. So you want to try and keep them happy within what's reasonable. You don't want to go and do a whole shitload of work for nothing. Um, so you, you want to keep your employer happy as well. So just bring them into the loop. But you don't want to do is make the situation any worse than it is because you get emotional and, and upset with them and it can be difficult sometimes particularly if you've gone out of the way to do something for them and then they get all shitty about something else uh you know it's quite natural to be quite pissed off with them uh, but to prevent it escalating basically you want to shut it down and, and keep them happy as quickly as possible within bounds of what's reasonable sometimes they may just need the right information because they've got the wrong idea Planning and organising a job. I'm going to delve too far into this, but um, yeah, obviously there's a massive variance of, of how complex jobs are. You might do service work and do five jobs or more a day. You might be doing a stadium and you're going to be there for three years uh, building it. So the level of detail and the planning and the sequence of it is going to be quite different across those. But in general, you know, you want to, you want to know what you're going there for. If possible, you get all that information up front. If not, if you're not doing like a new install or something, you may need to go there to see what the problem is, to correctly identify it. Oh, is water leaking at my vent? Or it could be one of several things. If you're doing maintenance all the time, it'd be a good idea to have a stock of commonly used equipment that you can put in and replace. Uh, go there, suss it out, see if you've got what you need. If not, go off and get it. You know, Write yourself a list. Uh, so you know exactly what you need and uh, come back and sort it all out um, you know work out what equipment you need try and minimize the wasted time doing 10 trips to the van or whatever you know if you can think ahead plan ahead uh, you'll be a lot more efficient people will be happier especially if they're paying the charge up um, go too far into this clean up there is a quick question on the clean up it's uh good practice clean up after yourself i know sometimes people uh volunteer to clean up uh, i would say you know you could let them 
scrub the floor or whatever, but you should at least sweep up the mere sand or take all your tools and equipment and stuff away. So at the very least do a basic clean up. Um, you know, potentially if you don't clean up, leave a big mess and then they stand on a nail or something when they're doing it, that puts you in a pretty awkward situation and they can then, you know, make some sort of complaint or whatever. So cover your ass, do, do a basic clean up and leave the place as reasonable as practical. Um, but if they want to do all the dusting or whatever, let them do that part of it. Um, it's important to just keep people informed. Let's say you do a little project by yourself, whatever it is, bathroom, pipe out, house, whatever. Something goes a bit astray, or you know, there's an expectation of you, they should give you an expectation of time frame. They think you're going to be there three days. Suddenly, you go there, you've got to do a bunch of extra work, or you couldn't do something, you're a bit delayed and kind of got mucked around a bit. Something didn't turn up, you wait around two hours. You know, you need to update people, your boss, whoever. Um, the customer potentially about the new time frame because of blah blah blah. Uh, so things change if you keep everyone in the loop. Um, you know, that's okay. If the, there is a big deadline, they may put another worker there to help you finish it on time, stuff like that. Sometimes there's penalties, particularly on big commercial buildings, if they're not finished on time. So, um, you know, there's often a big push at the end of the project to uh, catch up and get everything finished. <clears throat> 